tina koutou. Nga mihi nui ki te mana whenua, te atiawa, nga te tōranga tira, nga te tama me hapu koutou o te wanganui o tara. Ko Esther Tobana ho, ko Horeki o ho. Kia ora, and welcome to all the data, the Spark All Access Pass in volume. My name is Esther Tobin and I was one of the project team who worked on this exhibition, along with my colleagues Victoria, Victoria Travis and Tanya Wilkinson, who couldn't be here today, but must be mentioned. Niels and I are fully cognizant that this is 2.45 in the afternoon. It's the last speaking of the conference, and our title includes the tantalizing phrase, all the data. So your, uh, your um, presence is greatly appreciated. Niels, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Niels. I'm the digital experience manager in passing um, at the Oakland Museum. <laughs> um, and happy to talk uh, to the second part of this presentation, which is all the data. So see you soon. So we wanted to share with you our experience of adding digital collectible content to a large-scale temporary exhibition. This talk will give you all the data, what worked, what didn't work, but first off, I'm going to describe to you what the exhibition volume was all about. Volume Making Music and Aotearoa was a partnership project between us, Auckland Museum, and New Zealand Hall of Fame Trust, which is comprised of APRA and Recorded Music New Zealand. It was an ambitious project, the first ever major exhibition to tell the story of popular music of New Zealand. Uh, volume closed uh, this year at Auckland Museum in May and opened in October of the previous year. A really important point I want to make about volume is that Auckland Museum does not have a music collection and nor do we have a music curator. This was from the outset a community-based project and probably the best way to illustrate that is the show included a whopping 183 objects one from our collection, and the rest was us literally going into musicians' homes and finding their lyrics, their clothing, their memorabilia, their journals and their stories, and retrieving them from their wardrobes and taking them into the museum. So I think it's probably our team's best example as so far as of community-based development. And who was it for? The audience, uh, the exhibition, sorry, was developed for an audience we define as independent adults, anyone from 15 and up. But we also had a focus audience of 15 to 25 year olds, a very elusive audience for museums. You know, these people are out making music and going to gigs, not, not walking in our door. But we knew if there was ever a show to get them in there, it would be one, this one, about music. And because we were working so hard to get those young folk in the door, we flipped the chronology. We told the story of, of New Zealand's music from Today, we started in the 2000s, so when young people worked in the door, they saw their music contemporaries first, and then as they wound their way back through to the 1950s, they were getting into touch with less familiar content, content their parents or their grandparents might be having a moment with. So, um, so yeah, so just, just to be clear, that it was starting in the 2000s, and it went decade by decade back through to the 1950s. Oh, there's a blank. So there we have the 2000s, Lord. 1990s with a big guitar story for any guitar fans out there. We had 10 guitars from iconic uh, musicians around New Zealand. 1980s, 70s, you'll see a Spidians costume right there in the far right, and 1950s and 60s, which we combined for the purpose of, of this exhibition. Anyone wondering about the pink fluffy suit, who that belonged to? That was Andrew Fagan um, from the Mockers. And our project team fell deeply in love with this object for the course of the project and effectually termed it the Pink Yeti. And uh, Andrew was said to have worn it each night on tour, um, sweating profusely, never once washed it, but would dry it over a heater each night, ready for the next day and the next performance. You can see why we love it. So the exhibition contains... As I said, 183 objects from the community, over 400 photos. There's a beautiful photo there of Chris Knox with his TAC 4 track for any Flying Nun fans. Probably the biggest collection of New Zealand music photography ever sourced in Aotearoa. Um, and a large number of participatory experiences. This was an exhibition about making music, so we wanted to put visitors at the centre of the music as consumers, but also provide them with opportunities to have a go at making some. The exhibition was packed with both analogue and digital experiences. So, for example, you can see here two young visitors learning how to play ten guitars on the ukulele. 
One point I really want to make clear is that the exhibition's interpretive intent was established from the outset. Imagine that. The level of planning and consideration of the overall visitor experience, the pacing of all the interactives and what we wanted to achieve was very, very clear to us. We had some cool ideas about participatory experiences, we thought they were cool, and that included some digital ones, um, but we didn't have all the answers. So we did an RFP out to a range of digital providers and um, asked them to respond to some of our cool ideas, and also and if they had any of these of, of their own. Um, and it's fair to say every one of them came back with this idea of collectible content. Enter Spark. So early on in the project, we'd always thought about this idea. Wouldn't it be cool if you could take away some of the stuff that you'd seen in the show? But it surpassed our wildest digital and budgetary dreams. About halfway through the development of volume, we partnered with Spark. Um, and this enabled us to add this digital layer. Um, our team had a, I think, I think healthy, Nils, you might disagree, amount of scepticism about um, collectible content. Yeah, we didn't want to just give people labels. They don't want labels um, to take home. We wanted content that was worthy of collecting. We wanted to add more depth. It's not just the question of can we collect it, but why is a criti critical decision that we need to ask ourselves. So we worked with Spark and Satellite Media to identify existing things in the show that we could collect and also develop some brand new ones. I think the beauty of the arrangement is that, that our intent for the show um, was matched with Sparks. Um, they didn't just want to slam their logo all over the exhibition. They wanted to enhance the visitor experience. Um, their presence was an imposition in the show, and we tested that actually with some of our VMR research, and, and the findings were, were supported that. People didn't feel like it was an obvious slamming in of Spark. Um, it fitted with our own framework. So this is how it works. Um, we developed an all-access pass, a card on a lanyard. And each visitor was given a lanyard at the entrance of the exhibition, which you can see up there, by a visitor host. So a key part of this process is that we all know visitors do not read labels. And uh, you cannot rely on text to communicate an experience like this. You need to have a human there encouraging them and explaining the process. We also knew, we knew that not everybody would want to engage with our all access pass, and that was fine with us. It wasn't key to the exhibition experience. But if there was an interest or an inclination um, about it, that we wanted to make sure they were fully supported to participate. So each, each pass contains an NFC chip, and each night at 3 a.m. they would be digitally wiped clean, ready for the next day and the next visitor. So they were essentially recycled. So it's pretty simple. A visitor walks through the gallery, and when they want to take something away, they swipe their pass across, across the sensor, sta sensor station. You can see one up there on the far left. It makes a beep, and it's safe to their lanyard. And at the end of the exhibition, which you can see on the far right, they swipe for a final time, again supported by a visitor host, and they enter their mobile number or their email, and all their content is sent to them almost immediately. So I know what you all want to know really is what on earth were they collecting? So first off, tiny little image there to represent um, the first experience, which was when you're yet to even get into the exhibition proper. So you've just been handed a lanyard and you're invited to step onto a hot pink carpet, remembering we're a partner of Spark and this is their brand colour. This is the, the pink carpet moment as if you're a superstar at the Grammys about to pick up a whole raft um, of awards. It's also a photo moment that you can have with your family and friends. Once inside the exhibition, there's four films we made with young emerging musicians. You might recognise Wellingtonians, your own Esther up there on the screen. We also worked with Louis Baker from Wellington, um, Ray Zabiza, a hip-hop artist from Hamilton, and Campbell from Auckland. So four young emerging artists making music in our museum. So we filled them after hours in various beautiful locations in the museum, on our rooftop, in our Māori court, in our grand foyer, doing acoustic performances of brand new songs. Um, so when visitors arrive in the exhibition, the first thing they see actually is young emerging talent in New Zealand. But you probably don't want to stand there and watch, you know, five min uh, sorry, 20 minutes of, of film music videos. So you can tag it and take it home and watch it at your leisure. 
Once inside the 2000s, we recreated a recording studio. So this is, um, the desk on here is Dave Dobbins, actual recording desk. Um, and we worked with satellite media to create a guided experience where the visitor becomes the producer. So we worked with uh, DJ Sevilla, for any My FM fans, and created um, a video that talked through how to layer up a classic Shafu song called Fade Away. So you literally put your fingers on the dials and move the levels up till you've got the right level for the bass, the drums, the vocals. Um, once you've mastered the track, you get to swipe, take away the professional version and also a photo of yourself in that sweet studio with DJ Severe. This was um, the, uh, what we did is created some Spotify playlists, one in every single decade. So we worked with um, musicians, known musicians, and asked them what was their favourite music from the given decade. So this one here is Lady Six from the 2000s. So she put together her 10 to 12 favourite tracks from that decade, and any visitor could take home and listen to what, you know, what Lady Six was listening to. We're getting there. So... 90s, DJ VJ, so you can learn the basics of beat matching and adding visuals to music and then take a photo of yourself. The 1980s, one of our most popular experiences of all was where you could put your face on the cover of the iconic New Zealand uh, music magazine, Rip It Up. The fun bit was being able to choose your own genre and associated graphics, whether you were alt fan, a pop fan, a rock fan, um, and the look and feel of the cover would change depending on your choice. I think it's worth mentioning here that um, for all of these stations, you could retake your photo as many times as you wanted until you are happy. A really important point for our consumers. And secondly, you can tag um, multiple lanyards at the same time. So if I'm there with three friends and we take a photo together as DJs, we can get those photos together and don't have to recreate each time. In the 1980s, we worked with filmmaker Paul Cassidy and created five short documentaries, one to represent each of the decades. And they feature all the artists and all the um, objects, or not all, but many of the objects that feature outside in the physical space. So these were each six to nine minutes long. And surprisingly, many visitors did sit down and watch them all in one go, which totally surprised us. Um, we know people's intention spans in museums is like three minutes for a film. So um, credit to them. They watched them, but also many people tagged them. And Nils can um, will show you early, later how many people took them home and watched them in their full. So that was pretty exciting for us. 1970s. This is a poster. It's, a, it's like a pokey idea, you know, you press, press the button and you get a random word generator to give you a band name. So mine, for example, was Esther and the Shouty Coomera Bandits. Um, and then I get to plaster my poster with my name all over the streets of Auckland. And lastly, 50s and 60s. We recreated the Come On studio set. Don't know if any of you remember Come On, um, hosted by Peter Sinclair. So it was um, virtual go-go girls dancing and men in suave suits playing the guitar. And, and sorry, the takeaway here was you could sit down, as this woman's doing, take a photo of yourself, and then we put that on one of the performers and made a little film, archive film, um, which was super fun. I think, embarrassingly, we're going to show my one at the end of the show. Um, so that was it. And now what you've actually all come for, the data. Right. Thanks, Esther. So, uh, well, over the course of the exhibition, we could capture a lot of data, more than we've ever managed to capture before uh, for in-exhibition uh, interactive. So that gave us a lot of stuff to work with and just really explore what sort of in insights we could generate from it in the first place. Um, there's probably two points of difference worth pointing out. Um, comparing it to what Amos was talking about uh, with the bug lab um, data. So first and foremost, we were lucky enough for our supplier satellite to, uh, to crunch all the, the raw logs for us. So we didn't actually have to do that. We just got the final cleaned up numbers, which is really helpful. Um, and secondly, due to the, the mechanism of, of these personalized tagging lanyards, we could actually have something that was closer to a website session because we actually could Point, pinpoint it back to a single user or a group of single users, or a single group of users, um, which meant that it was kind of a bit more known territory in terms of how do you interpret that kind of data because it was a bit more like a website session, um, making it a bit easier for us to, to make sense of it. Anywho, that gave us a really good understanding of, of how visitors used to pass 
during and after the visit, after the visit, importantly. Um, so in the following, let's have a look at some of those numbers. So first and first of all, let's have a look at the overall attendance, just to kind of set the scene. So over the course of those 30 weeks, we attracted a total of 270,951 visitors. And typically then what happens is that we um, overlay those over time and see, uh, look at the spikes similar to, to um, what we saw for bugs and um, try to make sense of those spikes. So the obvious ones here are the school um, holidays, summer break and uh, Easter. And then there was this really ominous one in the middle there that we couldn't make any sense of at all because it just didn't fit the pattern until we pulled in um, the precipitation levels for Auckland, which happened to be just the same, and uh, just happened to be a rainy day, and people thought, oh, let's go to volume, it's nice and dry, and have a good time at the museum. So that was that riddle solved for us. Um, but in terms of uptake of the pass, once they made it into the exhibition, of course, we were very interested um, how they would use it. Um, so looking at our analytics, we could see that over 98,000 visitors um, had picked up a pass and tagged at least one item in the show. So that means that we had a 47% engagement rate of those visitors who made it to the show who picked up the thing and did something with it. However, we actually assume that that number is a bit higher because um, anecdotally we've seen lots of groups, especially families, sharing passes. Um, and, and, you know, doing stuff together with a single pass. So uh, that number is probably a bit higher, but we don't have any, any um, concrete figures on that. Um, but those, those were our engagers, right? Now, of those 98,000 engagers, about 66,000 registered their pass uh, at the end of the experience um, by completing a valid registration. So in total numbers, that means that we had a 67% um, conversion rate, which is equivalent to 32% uh, of all visitors who made it to the show. And we were very happy, not to say stoked as, with those figures. Um, and in our opinion, there is two really, two main reasons for the success. So firstly, um, visitors had to return the pass before they were actually in the show, right? So. And they were encouraged to do so by a visitor host, who then encouraged them to sign up and register the details. So it was very much a visitor host-led um, experience. We didn't just leave it up to, to good luck. Um, but more importantly, and then that really was a key learning for us, um, the registration kiosks were placed at the very end of the show. And this meant that visitors felt they had already invested through their engagement and created cool content that they, that they now saw value, value of, which was worthwhile for them to take with them. So if we had front-loaded that whole process, which is a bit tedious, you know, you get people to punch in their stuff, and it takes forever, why wouldn't I do that? I don't even know what to expect. But by the time they've done all of that, and they spent all that time, they knew what they were going to get in, uh, so they were happy to put in the details. And we were also really excited to see that over 11,000 people actually returned to the exhibition at least once to collect more content. So even though that meant that they had picked up a new pass because they had give, you know, had to have, give their old one back for the left, um, they still use the same unique identifier, which is the email address or the mobile number, um, which then allowed us to pair their new acquisitions with their existing collections and provide us with this figure. Now, all of that activity uh, resulted in a beautiful big dumb number, which is just too good not to share, <laughs> because across all the stations within the exhibition, uh, we tagged around about half a million items um, by visitors, and probably some staff too, you know, I'm going to be honest, and there's no way for us to, to tell how many staff actually, staff tags are, are collated within that number, but still, pretty compelling number. And um, all of these were stored all these tagged items in this personalized website that, uh, that Esther mentioned. And visitors got sent that link after registration. And that website proved to be, in hindsight, a really, really good tool for us to generate additional insight um, on how attractive that collected content actually was to our visitors. 
because um, those analytics gathered from, from that website were actually quite complementary to, the, to, to our on-site stats from the actual tagging part. So let's let the cat right out of the bag. Out of those 68% um, percent converted engagers, so those who had completed the registration after using a pass, uh, an amazing 83% proceeded to access their personal mobile site through the supplied link. Now that was the ultimate conversion goal that we had f for, the, for the use of the pass, and it's an exceptionally high figure. So let that sink in, 83%. Uh, especially when we, when we compared it to our benchmark, which is the Cooper Hewitt, nothing less but the Cooper Hewitt pen, which in 2016, I'm happy to report, tracked a post-visit website retrieval rate of 28%. So, again, I'm very, very happy with, with, with that number. You know, it's just too good not to share. Um, right. So, in total numbers, we had about 77,000 visits, visits to the mobile site itself, which includes return visitors. And looking at the GA, uh, we can see that all of that activity resulted in 643,000 page views. And this is important because we can now tell that, on average, visitors looked at about eight different things, bits of content that they had collected during their sessions. And they spent two and a half minutes on the mobile site, which is significantly higher than they spend on mobile devices on our normal website. Um, that means that the content on their site was, a, on, on their, their personalized site was attractive enough to make them stay. So they liked what they got, basically, which is, which is great. And they liked it enough um, to come back. Be, which is reflected in the number of return visitations there at 36%. Also, um, not an exceptionally high result, but a solid one that we're, that we're also quite happy with. But did they like it enough to share it, which is the holy grail? Well, we don't really have hard facts on that, on, or stats on that, rather. Um, what was, I mean, they, they could share their ever popular selfies directly from that website um, and we have some stats from that, that that we can pull in so we do know that that six percent of the content was shared to Facebook uh, from the sharing buttons which is actually not that much um, but we had some predefined hashtags that we could then um, monitor and see uh, what people were sharing and where um, which gave us a rough idea even though, um, of course, they could share stuff privately and, and you know, on WhatsApp or without using the hashtags. But um, we, we still got a good idea of, of what they were sharing on Instagram and on Facebook, um, which doesn't look that much, actually. But, you know, take it as it is. But what was the most popular content? The big $1 million question. So um, what we did is we then took those two data sets, put them together in this... Um, rather traditional looking data visualization. <laughs> so what we can see here in blue is the number of tags in the exhibition and uh, in red the equivalent number of online visits um, of those collected things on the website. And in all its simplicity it's still quite powerful um, because it allows us to pick up any um, peculiarities and, and ask some more questions really. And that's where the journey starts. So comparing those two values also gives us um, a conversion rate. So the percentage of visitors who actually looked at the stuff they had collected, giving us a really good idea of what actually was attractive to them. So what was it then? The uh, number one is not this, no, no bug, unfortunately. I don't have anything sexy like that. It was the Rip It Up cover with 28,000 um, tags and 30, uh, 22, uh, 23,000 visits, which is an 80% conversion rate, followed by the DJ photo booth, which is another piece of unique selfie content, selfies work, uh, <laughs> tracking at 63%. And then, and that was really kind of a pleasant surprise for us as, you know, museum people, um, because it actually is related to some content and not necessarily vanity, um, were the music, the music docos that Esther had mentioned. Um, and that's, of course, because 
people were interested in the content, but they didn't have those 30 minutes to invest in the exhibition to, to watch all those docos, so just could swipe them and take them with them. So 42% um, percent of, of those people who collected them actually looked at them later on. But because that was a content thing, and we like content, um, we looked into that a bit closer and um, had the YouTube stats that we could pull in for that. So what we can see here is that the bulk amount of traffic was generated in the first month. And there was only really very, very little access to those, those um, videos in the long tail. And to break this down even further, this view shows the watch duration of each video in percent. So each video has its own color. And um, that's kind of the 100% there. So you can see that most of the videos were watched to their, to their, um, in their full length in the first month. Um, but then only the 90s one was watched and nothing else, whoever knows. So we, we can explain that first part with the, the stakeholders, you know, industry people, early engagers that came in for the show um, specifically, looked at all the content, then had a post visit experience, looked at the videos and had a great time. But um, with the 90s bit, so it's, it's a bit more difficult. I mean, we do know that the 90s section from the other VMR that we did was the most popular section in the show. Um, however, that doesn't really explain why only the 90s video was watched. So maybe it was shared on a blog or on somebody's Facebook page. Maybe DJ Sevier shared it on his Facebook and people came back to watch it. Not sure. Um, one last thing that we picked up on YouTube, which is really nice to see, was that over 50% watched those videos at home, on their computer or their TV, um, which is quite nice for us to know because it means that they wanted to see the thing in, their in its full glory and they actually went through the effort of, of you know, going home, bringing that link up again, loading it up, sitting down, watching the thing, um, which is really great because it shows a deep engagement with that content. It's not just, oh, I've got some content here, but it's actually making the effort of consuming it. Now. There are a few kind of weird, odd ones, outliers. Um, this one is a particularly interesting one. So we had those, those Spotify VIP playlists, and they attracted the highest number of tags in the exhibition by far. So you know we had some 220,000 tags for those things. But they also, at the same time, achieved the lowest conversion rate um, of all, all digital interactives that, that we were monitoring. And um, the only explanation that we could come up with is that visitors were get, sort of getting into the swing of tagging things. Oh, I can tag this, I can tag that, and that's really easy to tag. I'll, I'll just take that with me with the best intentions to listen to that stuff later on. But compared to the other things that were on, on the floor, like selfies, um, the playlists and the collection of those playlists didn't actually require a lot of engagement. So people didn't really have to do much. You know, there was no emotional investment meaning that the intrinsic value to the visitors was probably perceived as a bit lower, so they didn't actually bother to, to go and look at that stuff again. However, those ones who did, um, looking at the Spotify playlist, so we don't actually have Spotify stats, but we can see the public playlist, 255 followers on average on each of those playlists. So those people who made it to those playlists actually uh, liked them enough to be wanting to listen to them again. Um, the tour poster was another one, because it had a reasonably high number of tags, but a quite low number of, of visitation. And um, we really wondered why that would be. And well, for starters, obviously it doesn't have a selfie moment in it. So it's one lesson that we've learned. Um, but we found another explanation once we overlaid the data on the floor plan. And unfortunately, we didn't have breadcrumbs, which would have been great. Um, so we had to make do with my rather clumsy uh, attempt to overlay the physical data to the spatial plan, which you can see here. Um, but the poster designer, which is uh, there, um, happened to be located just next to the popular pop band Interactive, right? So people were queuing up to play those instruments, and it was always long queues. And um, so we think what happened is that visitors designed and collected um, their, their poster to pass some time, but they weren't really too interested in the content itself. It's just kind of like, oh, yeah, just while I'm waiting and see what happens. Um, what the map also did is it captured our interest around 
DJ Severe and his mixing desk because um, that one was interesting because the VMR told us that this by far, by far was the most popular interactive in the entire show to our visitors, which is merit in that actually the highest um, tagging access conversion rate of 94%. So we can see in the analytics that it was super popular and, and people were interested in it. But at the same time, it's the lowest number of tags of all taggable interactives in the show. So we wonder why, you know, why is that? So we think there's, there's a couple of reasons again for that, or what could be. Firstly, it was the first self-led tagging uh, activity in the space, so visitors didn't, you might not have really gotten the hang of it yet. Um, and the, the whole idea of tagging was a new thing to them. Um, but it was also the only experience where visitors were actually asked to collect or tag two things during the process. So they could collect the song that they had remixed or the, the good version of it uh, in the middle of that uh, um, experience. And then towards the end, we would ask them to stick around a bit longer and have the selfie moment with, with DJ uh, Severe. But uh, we think that that timing was off. So people were actually asked or expected to sit there too long to actually see that prompt, especially as cues were, were lining up before the thing and, and kind of encouraging people to, to move on quickly. So I think that's, that's probably one of the reasons, or the biggest reason, why people actually didn't even see that prompt coming up. Which brings me to the key insights. So, key takeaways. Interpretive planning. Ensure any collectible content is inextricably linked to your interpretive plan. It's not about collecting for the sake of it. Provide the platform. Instead of asking visitors to use their own device, we give them something, um, and, and also not only using their own device, but in our museum, which has at times dodgy Wi-Fi, we gave them something really simple that they could just wear. Thirdly, use people, and by that I mean visitor hosts. Um, use them as the means of explaining how a piece of tech works. Um, don't use text labels. Four, geography matters, sort of stating the bleeding obvious, but um, stations and strong sight lines and content and strong sight lines gets used and everything else doesn't. And also think about your pacing. Don't load everything at the front, don't load everything at the end. Make it a well-paced visitor experience in terms of digital collectible content. Participation, participation, I've got that from you, from the weather, participation matters. So if the visitor's done something in the exhibition to help generate the material, they're invested and they'll bother to revisit it post-visit. And lastly, selfies always matter. It's very simple. If you're in the photo, then it will be a winner. And a wise man once said. In the last session, if you weren't here. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> Speaking to the geography point that Esther has made. So I guess that leaves us with um, this. So we know that the visitors loved it. 93% um, uh, said, yay, super awesome. Um, so what we do it again is the big question. And the big answer is we are doing it again. Um, so the experiment continues in our newly opened um, Pocano he World War I Learning Gallery, uh, which you should really come and check out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, where formal learners can collect things onto a little collection card, which is uh, not an NFC card, making it cheaper, but an optical scan. It's sort of more like your New Zealand check-in process. Um, also means that it will be easier for us to scale that if we want to, so we could print that same barcode on the ticket, and then they could use the ticket to scan it. Um, so we're, using, we're, we're actually pulling back a technology layer, a barrier, to um, future-proof that. And um, it's, it is a very different purpose. So it's not necessarily aimed at, at uh, the general public. So it's part of an educational programming offer. So we offer that to schools as part of a package. Um, so it has a different, very different target audience at the same time. Um, but our goal really is to, to gather more data to complete the picture for us, to kind of to approach this from the very other end of the spectrum. So we have those, those volume, high engagement types here, and then we have the formal learners here. Where's the sweet spot in the middle? And if we find that, what does it mean? Should we scale? Will we scale? Um, is it going to be as successful as the infamous selfie? So watch the space. Uh, 
my embarrassing bit. <laughs> Thank you. Sing this, eh?